Well, she won. I, I, I think she's a little broadcast from my phone up there. Yeah, I like it, <laughs> so, uh, it's great up on the... Well, someone with Eileen told me that she was like... <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Washington, D.C., in a little hamlet of a place called Eastland Gardens. Eastland Gardens was unique in that it was founded by blacks, developed by blacks, financed by blacks, and, um, and and just so you know, my husband's in the audience and he just instructed me to slow down, so I'm going to slow down. Thank you, Jack. Um, and I grew up in a very insular world, very safe, very protected. We did not talk about racism. We did not talk about race. We talked about being black. That's what was important to us growing up. 
I was born in 1957. It's easy to say now, I'm embracing that. <laughs> the same year that Washington became a German. So it was a very comfortable, comforting environment in which to grow up. So that's some of the background. And there's much more of it in the book that explains how that kind of upbringing informed me and gave me such a solid fit, very comfortable in my own skin. And that has really helped me a lot, particularly as I grew older and found out that the world was not, in fact, um, as welcoming as my upbringing had um, um, allowed me to believe. And, and this book is, is certainly your story, but it's also about family. Yes. Um, and so can you talk a little bit about your family? I'd love to talk about my family. Before we do that, then we should tell folks how we're related. I want to get to that. But we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. Let, 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 I think at some point we're going to, we're going to break down uh, your relationship to Jefferson and the Hemingway family. Maybe yes. We can talk because about we're that. Because we're both Hemingways. We, we are. Yes. We are. But, but not through Sally Hemingway, no. but through her siblings. Yes. So we'll get into that. We're, we are going to get Okay. But, but I, want to, I want to hear a little bit more about your family yes. because it's, it's through your family that you began to understand who you were broadly, and you, and you tell the story. So, when I was 13 years old, I heard my oldest sister, who was almost 20 years older than I, I'm the last in the family to buy her youngest by many years, during a conversation she had with my dad, explain that I had told them I'm descended from Thomas Jefferson. So I was quite shocked when I overheard this conversation between Dad and my sister, having never heard before that we were related to Thomas Jefferson. So I asked, of course, my dad and my sister, well, how could this be? And Daddy just said, ah, that's what they said. He didn't know much about it, didn't have much to say about it. At least he wasn't willing to say that much about it at that point. But it seemed very unlikely to me, obviously. I'm a black kid growing up in Washington, D.C. Thomas Jefferson's a white man. I was aware of that by the time I was 13. He wrote the Declaration of Independence, and here's what I didn't know. Here's what we were not told in school, that Jefferson owned human beings. So uh, there was no way for me at that point to process how I could have been the product of a, any sort of relationship that Thomas Jefferson had. It just didn't make sense. But I was determined to find that. I was determined to know. And that began an odyssey that lasted 45 years. And it's ongoing right now. I'm still trying to gather more information, but I was determined at 13 years old to figure out how that could possibly be true. I should add, although I had my doubts, it didn't make sense to me, I did have some evidence before me. As my dad was 6'2", had red hair and freckles. He also had, he also had a macaroni nose with a bridge that had a slope. And I would learn years later that that's the Jefferson. I would also learn that my dad's mother was from Charlottesville. And I learned that from my dad as I continued to prod him to give me more information. And one day, dad says to me, well, you know my mother was from Charlottesville. And I kind of gasped. And I said, Daddy, Jefferson was from Charlottesville. And he said very calm in his way, very dignified man. I know. So there was something there that daddy knew all along. He just didn't want to talk about it. And the reason he didn't want to talk about it, a lot of us would understand is because my father suspected, I can't say that he knew, but he suspected that he looked the way he did, and he looked like a white man, because a woman, his ancestor, had been raped or somehow exploited and compromised. And he really resented that. And that much he did eventually share with me when he thought I was old enough to understand him. I mean, when, when, you, when, when you get to that point and we talk about any family, you know that families are in the book, you write about the day it all came crashing down. Yeah. I'm going to take my jacket off because it's hot. Thank you. And we can just, um, can we, we can give this to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a, a lot of things were crashing down when I was 13 years old. Um, one of the things that was really most difficult to write about for me was about my parents. For many years, of course, we all believe our parents had like marriage as well. I learned when I was 13 years old that they did not have a marriage. 
And so that was very difficult, very painful. And I used this referencing information almost as a distraction, um, as a tool to help me bond with my dad, protect my dad, and to learn at the same time what the relationship was that we had with Jefferson, and to try to do some self comfort It's Again, you said it's complicated. It really is complicated. And I, I work very hard in telling a very honest story when I talk about my parents and I adore both of them. Um, it's hard to just close information about people who are so close to you and so important to you. But in order to understand why I was so motivated, I needed to disclose that. And you did it very well. I mean, it was very compelling. But you also, you know, talked about your family structure because right. uh, I learned so much about you from reading the book. Um, we've had lots of conversations, but um, just knowing that you're the youngest yes. of five, uh, and um, you you didn't have a relationship with your older sister Jan, right. but you right. developed one later on, certainly uh, when you were in college. Can you tell us a little bit about your sister Jan? So my sister, as I mentioned earlier, Janice is 20 years older than I am. She had a family of her own when I was in first grade. So when I'm six, she has a child. And eventually, I told her three. And she had been in Asia, living um, in Singapore specifically, where her husband was covering the Vietnam War for Time magazine. And it was at that time when her return from Asia that I heard the Jefferson story. And so during that period, I developed a close relationship with her because she seemed to be the one person who was really willing to talk about this. As I mentioned earlier, my father was not. But Janice loved her. And so she was more than willing to engage in this mystery with me and to try to uncover it with me. So for, for years, Janice and I worked together in, in trying to determine what the relationship was that our family could have had with Jefferson. And it was Janice who first told me about Sally Hemings. And this began when I was at Howard University. At around the same time a book written by Juan Brody was released, and Juan Brody wrote an intimate history of Jefferson, it's called, was the first scholar in the 20th century to, let's put the same spells, to expose that Jefferson had children who had been enslaved women named Sarah Hemings. So my sister and I determined it must have been through Hemings and Jefferson that we had this tie to Monticello. We didn't know, but we hung on to that for many years because we couldn't imagine, in our limited imaginations, that there could have been any other way. Because we didn't know the narrative. And you do, and you also um, spoke about your Aunt Peachy. Aunt Peachy. So, the, that's, I'm so glad you brought up Aunt Peachy. So the question would be, how did Janice know this information? It was something that our family obviously didn't talk about. It was something my father didn't want to talk about. How did Janice well, she heard it from a woman named Aunt Peachy. I never knew Aunt Peachy. Aunt Peachy was, she died soon after I was born. Aunt Peachy was a domestic woman, a domestic worker, who could not read, write, or spell her own name. But this she knew. She was my grandmother's half sister. My grandmother died years before I was born. In fact, she died when my dad was five years old. Aunt Peachy was my grandmother's half sister. And she will say to Janice, you're descended from Thomas Jefferson. I'm not, because it was three I had sister my grandmother. She will say, you're descended from Thomas Jefferson, but I'm not alone. And she said that repeatedly. And Janice listened. Janice did not dismiss our teacher. She, she embraced her. She didn't matter to her that she was very sincere, that she was not undereducated, she was uneducated. She couldn't write. But she knew the importance, the historical importance of her descendants being related to her parents. And that's how I think that the story because that's how Janice discovered it. And it speaks so much about the oral tradition in many of our families. Indeed. Certainly, there was nothing written down at, at that point. We didn't have any documentation. Of course, you introduced the Tom Brody book. But through the oral tradition, you knew that there was some truth. We believed, believed it. it. We believed it. We yeah. accepted it. And, and, and 
I'm glad you brought that up, Jay, because there is this oral tradition among black families. I, we wouldn't have known to call it an oral tradition, but that's what it was, because there was no documentation unless you could find records to indicate the ownership of your ancestors. Perhaps you could find tax records or ledgers. That's very challenging. Most black people hit this wall of 1870, the first census after um, the Civil War. So it's very difficult to know who our people were. The only thing we had was oral history. It was illegal to teach enslaved people to read and write. So what else did we have? And we, and we believed and we trusted it. And thank goodness we did. Janice hadn't trusted our teaching, then we wouldn't be here tonight. And it's the same thing for millions of black families. Listen to your relatives. And, and engage with them. Talk with them. Because I'm older now. I know the older we get, the more we want to talk and share. And, and older family members want you to have this information, gather it before it is too late. There's so many questions I would have wanted to ask my people who are living in my lifetime, my great uh, aunts and uncles, even mom and dad who no longer with us. So many questions I would have wanted to ask them now that I know the process, now that I know what's appropriate, now that I know how to express this because I've done it. Um, so, my so do take advantage of your elders because they want to share, and it's very precious information. All right, I'm going to ask you a question about something you wrote in the book. Yes. Uh, and this was uh, something your dad said. Mm -hmm. You said your dad was more interested in the family he knew, not the family he had lost. Right. And so why were you so determined to find the truth about your past? Not that I felt ruthless, I didn't. It's that I love history. Um, I also felt that my dad was interested, but he needs to back up a little bit on this without giving away too much because we have a good group of white people in the community. My father lost much, much of his family. He lost much of his family to death, to migration. His family left Virginia and moved up to Washington and other parts north. He lost um, some of his family to people crossing over from black to white. So for him to consider connecting to the past would have been heartbreaking. So he always tried to move forward. And I think this is pretty common for black families because the past is so painful and so much you can't know. I, however, believed that if I could find my dad's family, I could help heal his wounds. And I knew my father. And that's one of the reasons I pursued with so much vigor finding who his family was. And ultimately, well, we'll, we'll leave that a mystery. <laughs> yeah. Because we want everyone to read the book. <laughs> right. But I, I want to just kind of give people a taste of, I mean, this is a very compelling story. Thank you. It's a very personal story. And I want folks to kind of get a picture of you go into great detail right. and setting it up. Because it didn't, you didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm related to Jefferson, or I'm related to the Hemings, and, and it, it was a journey. It was a journey. It was a journey. Um, and, and again, it was sparked for many complex reasons. One among them, obviously, is curiosity of how a little black girl, such as myself, would be related to Thomas Jefferson. And the other, of course, was trying to, as I mentioned earlier, um, um, find some piece of solace for my dad because he lost his family. Um, and it, it was a process. And, it took many years of conversations with people who survived. The only person who survived in my dad's family, aside from himself, was his brother. I talked with him. I talked with people who knew them. Um, I did lots of research. And ultimately, that research led me to Monticello. Um, it led me to Monticello and to um, a project called the Getty Word Oral History Project. And I just want to tell a little story about how this happened. Yes, yes. So, I'm a D.C. girl. I love Washington, D.C. I could never have imagined in my life that I would have moved to Richmond, Virginia. But I fell in love, got married, and ended up moving to Richmond with my husband, Jackie Black Jr., the person who's going to tell me to slow down again because my speeding is <laughs> 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 Yes. And we end up in Richmond. Richmond is 70 miles from Mount Monticello. And so I started going regularly to Monticello because I wanted to understand that space. And I wanted to get the attention of people there. 
So I looked at the Monticello, and every time we visited, the guides would mention Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson. Now remember, I believe, and my sister and I believed up to that point, that we were descendants of Sally Hemings and Hemings. So we would go, and the guides would say, yes, Sally Hemings and Th Thomas Jefferson, many scholars believe we've had children together, and then move on with the tour. But every time you know, that guy would do that, he was always a different guy, and he had lots of guys at Monticello. I would raise my hand, and I would make and say, I'm related to Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And the guys would say, oh, yeah, good for you. They came before. <laughs> <laughs> well, in 2010, my son, who was at this point, 17 and tall, he's already six feet tall. My son and I went to Monticello on a beautiful May day. It was gorgeous in the garden of 70 miles. And we get to the um, to the east entrance. We're on the tour, and the guide says, Yes, yeah, Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson, many scholars, but we had this relationship that confused many children. And we did the same thing. I raised my hand and said, I'm related to Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. And I point to my tall son. And the guide says, Wow, you're dignitaries. Your family. And at last, <laughs> I'm getting the attention that we need. And she says, come and we'll take you on the private tour, which she did. She took us to the dome room, the famous dome that you see on the nipple, on the back of the nipple. And she introduced us um, to a project called the Getting Word Oral History Project, which was founded by a woman named Cinder Stanton. She was the principal founder of it. And Cinder Stanton and I connected after a few weeks. And it was Cindy who helped me find my connection to the Jefferson family. It was the Getting Word Oral History Project is a is a 28 year old archive where uh, Cinder and a woman named Diane Swan Wright and another woman Beverly help me cousin Beverly Gray Beverly Gray traveled all across the country collecting oral histories from the descendants of Monticello's estate. So. It was, it's a phenomenal project, and it's um, the seminal project of its kind, aside from the project um, uh, initiated during FDR's period. So um, our project, the National Archives, where you did. So, see how this connection is? <laughs> so, Cinder was the first one to find my grandmother, by whom we knew very little, because she died, as I said, when my father was five years old. Found my grandmother's census records, 1900. She was 18 years old, living with a great granddaughter, Thomas Jefferson. So I had gasps because after all these years, we finally found this connection. We move forward and we find more census records, and finally we discover. And there's a lot, a lot in the chain, but finally we discover that her mother, a woman named Rachel. And my grandmother had two names, by the way. Rachel Robinson, I'm sorry. Eva Robinson and Eva Taylor. She was living as Eva Robinson in Jefferson's great granddaughter's Her mother was named Rachel Robinson. And she was living just two doors down in the census of 1880 from a man named Montreal Robinson Taylor. Her grandmother had two names, Robinson. Who do you think Montreal Robinson Taylor was? Unmarried, living in the household. Rachel Robinson, unmarried, living in the household, two doors down, with two children. Who do you think Montreal Robinson Taylor was? Yeah, Taylor. Thomas Jefferson's <laughs> great great grandson. Wow. Yes. <laughs> great great grandson. So it turns out that Thomas Jefferson. Great great grandson was my great grandfather. And that's the connection with Jefferson. So it was not through Sally Hemings. It was through one of Jefferson's descendants. So let me just put this into wait. Oh, oh, wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Wait, there's more. Come on in. Some of my classmates are arriving. So it's good to see you guys. It's a it's a it's a rainy night, so I'm really glad you guys made it out here. So, there's more. There's more. So, what, and here's some more. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> By the way, my cousin and I work really well together. We've done something similar before. What's that about that? Yes. Well, that's a funny story. That's a funny it, story. It, it, it I'm going to tell that story. Yeah, well. So, I, I was very disappointed when I found out I was descended 
from tail and not related to sound. And we did not know who Rachel Robinson was. We didn't know who her ancestors were. Until Cindy Stanton, who's the patron saint, I must tell you, of Monticello's descendant community, Cindy Stanton finds a document one day. And on that document is a man's name, a man named Peter Robinson. And Peter Robinson was my great grandmother's brother. And it's his death certificate. And on this death certificate, it gives the name of his mother. Her maiden name. Guess what her maiden name was? Hannah. Yes. From my very smart <laughs> Thank you. Elementary school. High school and college. <laughs> Sally Hemmings was her name. Oh. Oh. Sally Hemmings. She was named after her famous aunt. Her father's name was Peter. Peter Hemmings. Also, I served the mom child. He was my three times great great. Sally Hemings' brother, one of her brothers. So, voila, it turns out I was a Hemings after all. That was one of the happiest days ever. <laughs> and it was so funny when, when, we, when we met um, at the Slave Debt yes. Project. I mean, you knew by that time you knew all this. Mm -hmm. So, that was 2016, and you were ready to tell us. <laughs> yes. You know, but, you know, as fascinating as it was, you had another connection, and you talk about this connection even more um, because you're also related to the Humbers. As well. Right. So the Robins, the Hemming slash Robinson family married into the Hubbard family. And this happened in the enslaved community of, at Monticello because Jefferson owned 600 enslaved people during his lifetime. Um, and not only at Monticello, but at other plantations he owned. He encouraged his enslaved community to marry within their boundaries. And, and not, um, at, uh, they, they would call it, not abroad is what he would call it. And he would give them little gifts like an extra pan or an extra blanket if they married in the community. So there were, so my family, I know, <laughs> so my, I know, you can only shake your head. <laughs> <laughs> so my family, so the Hemings Robinsons married into the Hemings family. Now, what, the story that Jay wants me to tell you, which I'm thrilled to do, is that the Hemings, the Hubbards were very bold. For the, all of my ancestors were courageous and strong. We kind of know this because they survived such an oppressive system and were here. Hubbards, however, were ahead of us because they escaped, or at least attempted to. One in particular, James Hubbard, they called him Rainy, attempted to escape not once, but twice. Jefferson gave him a break the second time. They brought him back, and he says, okay, he was contrite, and he was clever. He was contrite, I'm so sorry, and he continued to save money and plan and escape the second time. He um, was free, I guess you could say, for one year before he was captured. Uh, he was a fugitive, and he was captured and brought back, and Thomas Jefferson had him whipped before his comrades were sent, and then he was so sad. So, as Jefferson said, this will be an exact quote, as if he never existed. He wanted to humiliate him before his comrades and teach him a lesson and then get rid of him. So, when I was a little girl, I was really proud, even though it was a hard story to believe, I was really proud to be descended from Thomas Jefferson because he written the Declaration of Independence and he was my favorite president. So, I want you to think about feelings now to know the truth. It's imperative that we know the truth. Our founders, like all humans, were flawed. Jefferson is not this carving out Mount Rushmore. He did his things for his own people. He also wrote the Declaration. It's a great document. Someone said to me recently, the most famous document aside from the Bible. There's treasure in there. But there's horror to some of the things he did, and we must learn that. If we're going to grow and to heal as a nation, we must recognize that. It was hard for me, but I do and I did. And it's interesting because when we met that day, um, you did speak about the Robinson connection, you did speak about um, the Hemings connection, which we'll, we'll talk about that now. But 
you were really proud of the Hubbard. I am. You were really proud of You sort of like want that. You know, I'm a Hubbard. Right. And this was the Hubbard story. And it's such a fascinating story because we don't hear those stories. Yet. We often think that those enslaved or the narrative sometimes is that, you know, there were people who were just, just, you know, happy just to be there sometimes. Or, that's the Virginia story. Well, that's the Virginia story. But that certainly wasn't the case with the Hubbards and many, many others. Absolutely. Um, they, they were survivors. But we are related. Yes. We're distant cousins um, to the Hemings line. Why don't you share how that came about? Where, where we're related. So your family and, and, and your dad also named um, um, Mr. Jefferson. Jones. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and by the way, we should note that Jefferson does not come from their ties to Monticello. That's coincidental. Well, we'll, we'll share that now. Um, so, your family is descended from Betty Graham, and Betty Graham is the daughter of Elizabeth Hemmings. Elizabeth Hemmings is the mother of Sally Hemmings, and my three times great grandfather, Peter Hemmings. Who was Elizabeth Hemmings? She was the concubine, the slave concubine of John Wales. Who was John Wales? He was Thomas Jefferson's father-in-law. So that means that there are lots of things to say in case. This means that, and she had ch children with three different men, and Betty Brown is not with John Wales. She's with another man. Um, um, but Peter and Sally and a few others were from Elizabeth and John Wales, which means that they were Jefferson, in another world, they would have been Jefferson's in -law. This means that the woman Jefferson married was Sally Hemmings' half sister. It also means that there were several generations of Jefferson related family members and Hemmings family members who were entangled with each other, who had relationships with each other, or relations, if you want to speak of it in a sexual term. Um, and that would have been John Wales and Elizabeth Hemmings, Jefferson's father in law. That would have been Jefferson and Sally. That would have been Jefferson's son-in-law, who took up with the Hemings after Jefferson's daughter died. Her name was Betty. They're buried next to each other. You can read that because their family felt so well of them. And his, he had another wife. She's buried with her family someplace else. Think about those dynamics. Just consider what must have been happening for that to happen. That's three. Then you have my own family, Jefferson's great-great-grandson and my great-grandmother, who was a so that's four families who were related by blood, who were related by ownership, who were related by law, because him, the Jeffersons and the Waleses and what had the land dogs, another Jefferson related family, owned the Hemmingses. Yeah. And we share a, for me, I believe, it's a seventh great grandmother named Elizabeth Hemmings. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're related. Right. She must so she's, no, she's, she's actually. Um, my fourth great grandmother. Okay, so she because was, uh, Peter was my third great grandmother. So she's, yeah. I think, for me, it's six or seven. That's just because you're a little younger than I am. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the genealogy, you know, fans out. And so uh, my, I'm descended from uh, Elizabeth's second daughter. They call her Betty. She's Elizabeth as well. And then that's where the line comes in because right. your ancestor and my ancestor. Now here's an interesting thing, and, and Jay, you can share this story. We've been separated, our families have been separated for decades. But we've come together thanks to the Getty Word Oral History Project. And it's just, this is the beautiful thing about learning your history. You asked why do I want to, you don't want to know this? It's been connected with family, people you're just meeting. It's as if we've known each other our entire lives. There's this bond we have. We connect, we communicate, share the rhythm. There's a syncopation that exists with us. And it, it, I'm getting chills when I think about it because it, it's, it's just such a warm feeling when you find your people that found my people. And it's wonderful. And if you're going to tell that oh story. Well, we'll both tell the story because it's a fascinating story. We were, well, I'll let you start off because you were the one that was instrumental in setting up. Uh, a conversation that you were to have in Dallas around the exhibit. Right. So you can tell right, that right. part in the world. And so, and so we'll, just, we'll just do a little brief um, introduction of this. So Monticello has a traveling, had a traveling exhibition 
called um, the Paradox of Liberty Slavery Jefferson's Monitor. And I became responsible for finding locations. Um, it was first here in the Smithsonian in 2012, and then um, we reintroduced it in 2015. And I became responsible for finding places for this exhibition to be, um, to be displayed. And the first place was at the African American Museum in Dallas, which is a beautiful museum in um, Dallas, Texas, on the fairgrounds. And he did a panel there. Um, it was very well attended. He did a panel there. And we decided as a family that it would be better if we took charge of that panel. Let's just put it that way. Yeah, that's <laughs> very, very nice way. <laughs> so we kind, of, we kind of had to wrestle it from the folks who, other people who wanted to be in charge of the panel. And it just happened so seamlessly. It was, it was more than seamless. And it was like we were all thinking the exact same thing, that the only person that could tell our story would be us, right. not someone else who was determined to tell our story and frame it the way they wanted to frame it. And um, we made a decision that we would sort of take the lead on this, I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> uh, we decided that, that Gail would, would open up the program and that I would moderate the discussion. And that the person who wanted to lead would kind of get the message and not lead it. And it was so funny because um, we came up with the plan, and uh, Gail went to the podium, and she introduced the program, and she looked over to me, and I didn't move immediately. I kind of hesitated. She looked at me like, okay, <laughs> you have a job to do. And immediately, um, I, I jumped into it, and we kind of took over the program. And, you know, it was, uh, there was, some folks were not necessarily happy about that. But we were. But we were absolutely <laughs> happy about it. We were absolutely happy about it. And, and on the panel, um, we had Gail's son, Charles. Yes. Charles was on the panel. Uh, my dad was on the panel. Uh, Andrew, who now works, uh, to my cello as well. Another cousin we discovered through this research. And we had a couple of other cousins from uh, Ohio as well. Yes. Uh, some some of the Hemings that went to Ohio uh, were students from Madison and Sally. Yes. And Sally. And so it was, we were all on the same page uh, at the same time. And it was like uh, we were family for all of our lives. But we actually were not family for all our lives. We really uh, were still getting to know each other. Exactly. But we knew each other already. Exactly. So that was the memory I think you talked about. It's, it's this lost memory, but the memory came back all right. of a sudden. Right? That's what your dad, Calvin, would say. It was, it was just so natural. Um, and, and your dad's one of my best friends now. So. <laughs> and you're one of his. Yeah, that's good. It's good it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and so my dad also now works uh, at Monticello. So it's like a family there. It the is. family is really coming together. And and now I think, uh, and I, think I want you to talk about this, um, and as you explained your relationship, I mean, uh, how, why is it so important that the descendants tell the story? So I'm glad you said as you described what happened in Dallas, because it's, you're right, we need to tell our own story. We, the book is called Reformation, and it's called Reformation for a reason. We need to reclaim our history. We need to reclaim those spaces that we built. We need to help America understand, and we need to understand ourselves, what our contributions as black people have been to the success of the United States of America. That's why it's important that descendants reclaim and tell that story again, when we iterate the values, speaking to elders, collecting information, knowing who we are, understanding that people who were dehumanized, our ancestors were dehumanized, that they were real people who managed under the worst possible circumstances to carve out the lives of themselves and build the foundation for us. And we must reclaim that history and tell our own story. And if America wasn't uh, the America that we know her to be, yes. we would have known each other a long time. We would have, yeah. Right? We would have grown up together. We would have grown up together, and we and we but sort I'm of we, that. we did, but we it, the irony is that we sort of had a parallel life growing up in DC. That's right? true. Um, you know, you went to Catholic school. Uh, I went to Catholic school. You went to Howard University. That's right. And you're graduate, and I went to Howard University too. So we we sort of we sort of were parallel, <laughs> and you know, we're a few years apart. No, not, not that many. Not that many. It's a good <laughs> <laughs> but we still, we still had similar, a 
similar journey yes. in beginning to understand how we are now absolutely and forever connected. Thanks. 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 That's very nice. Yeah. That was great. Do, do we have time for questions? Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, you can open these here. Yes. Yeah, I'll call it. So, I was 14 years old in 1961 when our family took the trip to Washington, D.C. and went down to Monticello. And I remember them showing us the servants. Okay. And, of course, that changed. And I would like to know what you discovered as to when and how the truth started coming out at Monticello from the story that was being perpetrated for hundreds of years at Monticello. So, just a little history. Um, the Thomas Jefferson Foundation is a nonprofit organization that owns and operates Monticello. And that was established in 1923. Up through that point, up from 1923 until the 1970s, when archaeologists Got, really got an interest in exploring more about the enslaved and started excavating part of Mulberry Road where the enslaved lived and worked and some free white workers as well. And it evolved from there. It had, um, um, right. That's not what he's been asking. He wants to know why they started talking about the truth about So, this so, so just so you know, Jackie White Jr., my husband, <laughs> used to be a reporter. And sometimes he likes to speak for me, and that's okay. We're <laughs> but so he wants to answer the question. That's okay. That's okay. So as I was saying, <laughs> so we went through this evolutionary process. I think it became important in the last few years um, under the leadership that we had, and our predecessor as well, to engage more of the authentic, honest story. They are scholars and historians who want to relay the truth and convey the truth. So I think that's part of it. Yeah, and I think um, and, and I think that Gail gave you that history for context. Gail is becoming a historian because right? historians like to give context, yes, always uh, like to give the backstory. And I think that getting to your question, um, and Gail mentioned this, there were, I remember growing up, uh, going to Monticello and, in the 70s where they began doing the archaeological digs. Uh, but certainly there were scholars, and, and, and Gail uh, mentioned one scholar, um, Cinder. Cinder Stan, who got to Monticello in about 1968, and she didn't leave. And it was, it was about 1993 that she found it getting word with the other individuals that uh, Gail mentioned. Diane Swan Wright and Beverly Gray. Right. And it was at that point where they started making the connections from the archaeological dig to the individuals, the persons, the enslaved persons who actually, as Cinder said, labored for, for Jefferson's happiness. And that's when the story started to begin uh, to be told that there were individuals who we knew of because Jefferson kept uh, immaculate records. So we always, the scouts always knew that Jefferson knew his, his so-called enslaved family. He knew them, the scholars always knew that. But it took scholars to begin to tell the story and focus on the descendants, not necessarily focus on Jefferson. I think that's what Cinder did, that's exactly um, what Cinder did. With, with getting work project. Right yes, yeah. You all are leaving after Keith Peter. Okay. Sorry to say. Mm -hmm. Keith Peter says that we were the DNA research, which, which, which established well, you can tell the story, but that's, I just throw it out there for you. None of that stuff you're talking about would have happened in the way that it happened if there had not been pressure on the Thomas Jefferson Foundation and Jefferson Scholars generally to acknowledge that this relationship between Thomas Jefferson and Sally Henry actually existed. Well, that's fair. Yeah. So, so, so what Jackie White Jr. is trying to say is that in 1998, when DNA became a tool to use to make familial connections. There was a study, um, um, I can't remember what it was called now, but it's been a very long week, I must tell you. But at any rate, um, 
uh, DNA was taken from a, a Jefferson, not from a Jefferson descendant, but from a relative of Jefferson's, uh, one of his nephews. And it was the Jefferson family always claimed that it's one of the nephews who fathered the children of Sally Hemings, and a descendant of, um, of Sally Hemings. And it, that, that DNA didn't match. Everything indicated that the, that Jefferson and Sally Hemings had children. And it was not because it was a DNA match, but because there was not a DNA match. And further, to add to that, every time Jefferson came back to visit Monticello after, um, at least from being in Washington, D.C. during his presidency, Norman Slay and Sally Hemings would have a baby. Every time. In addition to that, Madison Hemings, in 1873, I think it was, did a memoir, with, did an interview with a reporter in Ohio, who was living in Ohio, where he said that, a little more over history, that Jefferson was his father. So we have three pieces of information by 1998. We have the DNA that gave clear evidence that the, one of the Cobb brothers was not the father of Sally Hemings. We have um, the oral history from Madison Hemings, and then you have the documentation. And remember, Jefferson kept copious notes, he wrote down everything. You have the documentation that Sally Hemings had a child every time, not most every time after Jefferson visited. So, does that answer your question? Was that well, way more information than you needed? Well, actually, that, that was very interesting. <laughs> okay. but, but, no, it doesn't really answer my okay. question. I was more directed at. Monticello and the stories that they were telling and how and when they evolved into telling the truth. What 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 were the things that spurred them? I mean, was it this DNA evidence? Was it was it a, No, no, it wasn't That's why I was trying yeah, to yeah, tell exactly. that evolutionary story. Yeah, and, was I, and it was pretty much what I had said and what Gail had said. Yeah. I mean the, the truth was the, telling the telling the story from Monticello uh, really began by these archaeological exactly. digs. I mean, so they begin to find more information about those individuals who were actually enslaved on the plantation. And it was, uh, again, the work of Cinder beginning to tell the stories from the perspective of the enslaved. Um, so when you, when you ask the question about uh, when did they begin to tell the truth, well, uh, I think it, it was probably around 1993 with the Getting Word project uh, where they began to say things like, I would, I would go. I remember going to Monticello in the '90s, uh, and um, you would see Mulberry Row, and they would say enslaved person worked at Mulberry Row, and I said that we know who that enslaved person was. You know, we know, we know, we know that person's name, Farley <laughs> Hughes, <laughs> my ancestor. That's that's who worked in Mulberry Row. It was well documented, and it was around that time where you began to see the names of the individuals. So when you go to Monticello today, um, you, you see who served Jefferson, who, 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 who was the cook for Jefferson, and you see them by name. And so I, I think that, that so, so again, there was an exhibition that opened, I think, in 2015. That's pretty recent. It's, yeah, yeah. But, but it's not that they weren't giving the tours before, but they weren't as involved before. I, 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 look. Nothing happens overnight, nothing happens quickly. So it has been a process where Monticello has grown, frankly, to be a more inclusive place, not just in the way stories are told, but in who tells the stories. When I first came to Monticello, I was the only descendant to work there. Now there are three. And we will continue to grow. We, we invite, we encourage diverse people to come, black people to come work at Monticello to tell the story of the people who were enslaved there. Um, so we, there's an exhibition in the bowels of the building that focuses principally on the Hemingses because they were house servants. And their cutouts down, if, if you've been using it, you've seen those cutouts there where they identify, I'm glad you pointed that out, where they give these people names. They People had names, they were real people. And that's important, they were human beings. In 2018, we opened an, an exhibition called The Life of Sally Hemings, which Totally the demonstration she was not an appendage of Jefferson's. But she, again, she was a whole, full human being who was a seamstress and a world traveler and an emancipator because she brought in the 
Jefferson when she was only 14, 16 years old at that point, when they were in Paris, caring for their unborn children. So every one of their children who was arrived into adulthood was freed or was allowed to walk away from the plantation when they were 21 years old. So these are the stories you hear. And there's a kitchen, the first kitchen um, at, Mon at Monticello was excavated a few years ago. I mean, it used to be the bathroom. There was a bathroom. The there bathroom. was not a bathroom. The, the, bath, the kitchen and the, the Sally Henry's room, or the place we believe was Sally Henry's room, was for a long time bathrooms. If you can imagine how disgusting that must have been because they knew what those spaces were. But in that kitchen, it's called the Granger Henry's kitchen because that kitchen was the workplace for the Granger family and for the Henry's family. So we have identified those people. I'm so glad you said that, Jay, and we speak their names. Good. We give them their humanity. That's the whole thing. Are we there yet? No, yeah, that's very <laughs> <easy. Because laughs> You're telling me that there are actual exhibits naming these people yes. now. Yes. yes. But but essentially this didn't really happen until very recently. Well, the, the re so on the in on the, the, the part of the tour, more recently. Yeah. But in terms of the research, going back uh, right. 25 years. And, or more, because the, uh, because the archaeologists were doing the digs mm -hmm. back in the 70s. Exactly. So it's been going on. Even the late 80s, it's been going on. Well, also, according to the female. Please come back. So, you know what? What are the three questions? I'm going to just skip these. So, here's, here's how it works. Of course he did because he skipped gates. It just, yeah. you know, just how by having this program, um, um, finding your roots. But to, very briefly, I have a white cousin. Her name is Tess Taylor, and I found her via the internet, and we connected. And she wrote a story about it for the New York Times. And Skip Gates reached out to her and said, "Oh, well, how do you feel about doing a DNA test?" And she agreed and asked me, and I thought, well, "Yeah, sure." I was a little nervous about the whole thing because what other tests is John that we weren't related to Jefferson at all? But um, we had the test, and it was through Skip's um, initiation asking if we wanted to do so. And in addition to that, I should say that Skip and Jack have been friends for many, many, many years, and um, he's just been a great supporter of, of the work I do. And he's been to Monticello back in 2016. We had a conversation about um, a race and the consequences of slavery at Monticello, and he was one of the moderators for that program. So he's been very involved in that regard. So yes, I, I would say he's been quite helpful. Yeah. Am I getting the sign? Yeah, we're yeah. It's time <laughs> I just okay. noticed it was okay. okay. <laughs> well, thank you guys okay. for being here tonight. I know it was a rough night to be out. Thank you to my classmates for coming. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this applause is for you. <laughs> <laughs>